Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Good morning to other places, depending on where you are. Welcome to our event, uh, Emergency Response for Health, Human Rights and Justice. We are happy to be joined by partners, friends, old and new from different parts of the world. I understand this uh, webinar was uh, completely overscribed. We actually had to upgrade to a bigger group. So I, we are expecting quite a lot of people to be participating and we are really excited about that. My name is Lois Chingandu. I'm the acting uh, executive director of Frontline AIDS and I'm pleased to open today's event. I want to start by um, talking about uh, the urgent need for support to survivors of violence, persecution and discrimination of many kinds which helps to prevent HIV transmission and helps to keep people living with HIV on effective treatment. And this became a reality for us, particularly during the COVID time, when we could see that without that support, um, many people actually were lost to follow up and lost to HIV treatment. Eventually, when yeah, the organization were able, able to put this act together, we saw that there was an increase in the ability of people to continue on treatment. We have seen this uh, countless times through our emergency grant making with the Rapid Response Fund to LGBT+, sex workers, and harm reduction groups working on the front line of uh, human rights and HIV. Since it was launched at the end of 2016, Frontline AIDS has provided over 3.1 million in rapid response fund emergency grants to 289 organizations in 45 countries. Even then, when you think of this number, it looks like a lot, but when you compare with the need that is on the ground, you will still see that there is a lot that needs to be done. Communities and community-based organizations see members and patients in crisis every day, and most often uh, have to struggle to provide out of their pockets to move around limited uh, flexible budgets. A good example is what we saw in Mauritania. We had a, a gay couple who wanted uh, to mark their love and get married. Same-sex marriage and relationships are outlawed in Mauritania and punishable by imprisonment and death penalty. So the couple along with six guests were arrested and detained in jail where they were mistreated and denied access uh, to treatment and their regular medication. What was supposed to be a joyous hope actually in prison. Following their eventual release, the organization was able to ensure the LGBT individuals could remain safe and cared for with suitable housing and food and medical assistance. And that took uh, the Rapid Response Fund um, emergency grant to be able to support those kinds of things. Frontline AIDS has worked over the past year and a half with partners that are leading the way in running local and national emergency response mechanisms. These mechanisms offer a way to manage agent needs to mitigate harm and provide help as soon as possible whilst the organizations keep up their human rights work to prevent more emergencies in future. It is our pleasure today to share some of those learnings from those experiences in a new publication and to hear reflections from our speakers about what works and what more can be done. We are pleased to welcome a number of representatives of our donor agencies and foundations in our audience to learn more about how they might integrate emergency response funding into their programs with confidence that this is an essential part of a comprehensive rights-based and HIV response. I want to end by just by saying, even though we, when we say emergency response, we often think this is a short-term response, but what we know and what we see every day is that these emergencies are happening every day. There's just no time to stop. And therefore the resources are required as an ongoing basis in order to meet many of those uh, uh, challenges and support people that are in difficult circumstances. Um, with these few words, I would like to officially open this, this webinar and also to hand over to Ruth, who uh, will now facilitate the next section of our, of our webinar. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Lois. Um, it's really a pleasure to join you all here and to see so many people interested in today's topic. I'm going to just give a very little information about the publication and its background before um, showing a short video and handing to our speakers. So, as Lois mentioned, um, the Rapid Response Fund of Frontline AIDS went through some changes in 2021. And a major part of the fund now is actually supporting in-country and local uh, rapid response uh, systems. So we've been working with different partners. So you can see the logos of some of them on your screen. Um, those partners who are establishing or strengthening their own rapid response systems for human rights emergencies that link to HIV. Um, we were fortunate to finally get together as a group of partners last year um, at a workshop to share experiences, um, ideas, and indeed good practices um, about operating and designing emergency response systems. Um, out of that workshop, we have created this publication called The Good Practice Brief on Human Rights Emergency Response and HIV. Um, when all of these partners, including Frontline AIDS, started doing this work, we didn't have such publications. We didn't have good practice to refer to. So we hope that this can be a useful resource for organizations planning to start or strengthen their work in this area. We hope that it's also going to be um, a useful resource for program designers and funders to um, showcase the careful thinking that's gone into designing these kinds of systems so that they're safe, accountable, so that they are effective, and so that they contribute to wider HIV and human rights um, programs. Um, as Lois said, you know, we've got to think about how emergency response links up with, with longer term work. And hopefully you, you'll be excited to read in the publication some examples of um, how partners have used their emergency response mechanisms to inform advocacy and prevention work. Um, and you might hear a little bit more about that today. Um, before I introduce our speakers, we have a four minute video um, that will give you a bit more of a sense of what human rights emergency response means and what it can look like in different contexts. So without further ado, here it is. Or maybe. Apologies. I've been told that this is not working. <laughs> so let me let me try again and you might just see it in the context of the presentation. Hopefully you can see in here now. HIV makes people vulnerable. It leads to people's rights being um, um, violated. The help and the support we've been getting from Frontline Aids and all other partners to make sure that we do have some means to respond to emergency situations and improve people's uh, agency and the ability to bargain for what is right when it comes to their own sexual reproductive rights and health. <laughs> The benefit that the 
rapid response fund has um, added to that is that those intersectional needs that people have alongside um, their concerns about HIV status can now be um, addressed. If a response is not provided within the first 72 hours, that can be detrimental to the well-being and health of the, of the survivor and also to them even having a chance at getting justice. The Emergency Fund played a very critical role uh, in ensuring that it continues to empower community members to access, um, to negotiate um, their safety if it, when it comes to SRHR. It has enabled us to effectively engage um, healthcare service providers to do advocacy, to be able to reach and have discussions. It allows us to provide the assistance to someone who is in a very vulnerable position and needs help now, but it also enables us to collect the data and look at the systemic issues that are driving the pandemic. Community-led response for me is a response that puts the people at the center, not only as beneficiaries, but as masters of their own destiny. The people implementing it needed to be people who were part of the community, who were going to be the target of the REACT program. Collaboration is a very important aspect uh, as it ensures that our, you, uh, the kind of service you offer to the community members is streamlined and also it avoids duplication of resources. The key vision for Positive Vibes is really to add othering. Currently, you know, the rapid response, it sits within positive vibes. What I really want to see for the future is that it lives everywhere um, within the LGBTI and sex worker organizations because um, their proximity to the community makes the response much faster. We're already in discussion with a couple of community-based organizations on how we can partner with them in future if we can raise the funding to be able to roll out REACT programs. We do believe that, you know, we're taking the right steps and we are also learning as we're going and that, you know, there's a lot of success that, you know, um, awaits us in the future and that ultimately we can see this society we want that is equitable and just for everybody. So hopefully that has given you um, an overview of what we are talking about here today. Um, and it's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers, one of whom you will recognize from the, the video. Uh, we have Trevor Nzube from Trans Research in Education Advocacy and Training, also known as TREAT, joining us today from Zimbabwe, um, where he is the Programs Manager for TREAT. Uh, we also have Grace. Um, Grace is the regional coordinator for the African Sex Workers Alliance, that's ASWA. And we have Ronan Sweeney, um, who joins us to represent the global health team at the Department of Foreign Affairs for the Government of Ireland. Um, so, as we hear from our speakers, please feel free to continue to write any questions for them in the chat. Um, let me turn to you, Grace, first to ask what kinds of human rights emergencies does ASWA see um, and its members? And how are you currently able to respond to those emergencies? Okay, thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Um, okay, some of the emergencies linking to HIV that ASOA and our members uh, have seen is arbitrary arrests. And um, um, 
in most of the cases, in most times, in most African countries, we've seen where governments will wake up one day and arrest all sex workers in the streets. And um, this has been a very big challenge when it comes to sex workers who are on ARV uh, treatment. And it becomes a challenge where a paralegal or a peer can be able to take drugs uh, to the sex worker. We have also seen where governments just wake up one day and they will uh, decide that, um, I want to give an example of Benin, uh, the capital city of Benin, where um, uh, DC, um, somebody uh, like a mayor uh, in, in, in the city, in the capital city of Benin, woke up and said that uh, they need all sex workers swept out of the city. And uh, in this case, we saw a lot of sex workers being beaten and being uh, taken away from the city. So uh, we have seen in such cases where governments wake up and say that the city needs to be clean. And the, the simplest to clean the city as is removing sex workers. We've seen this as a very big challenge, mostly to sex workers who are accessing treatment. And most of, most of the sex workers will go into hiding or will go to, uh, to bars. And where they're accessing treatment, uh, the cohort gets lost or the sex worker goes away because they feel that they are targeted because they used to sell maybe in the city. Uh, we have also seen um, there is a lot of erratic supply of condoms and supplies. And mostly I want to talk about condoms because uh, we have seen a lot of cases in the African context, a lot of sex workers organization reporting to us were that uh, uh, there is no uh, condoms um, for sex workers. And uh, you'll be seen in cases where clients will beat sex workers because you don't have a condom, because clients, uh, it's a norm that they are used that uh, if I'm a sex worker, they are, I'm supposed to go with a condom. So we've seen this and uh, we know that uh, uh, when you have, um, most of the sex workers will end up having sex without condoms. And this has, uh, has ended up, um, uh, we have seen a rise of, of, of HIV among sex workers. I also want to highlight um, the issue of pandemics. And I want to give an example of COVID where everybody, uh, we are aware of what happened in COVID. But for us as sex workers, the most unique things though was, uh, there was a lot of stigmatization in terms of even um, government uh, uh, supplies, for example, government were giving food supplies, government were giving even uh, caution money, but sex workers were left out. We also saw where governments even closed down hospitals so that they can um, put them as isolation centers. And these hospitals were public hospitals where sex workers were accessing uh, ARVs. So we saw that sex workers feared even stigma going to those clinics. Uh, we have also seen relocation during even COVID humanitarian crisis. We've seen sex workers relocating to other places. And in most of the time, sex workers will shy away from going to start clinics in other places. And so we, we end up losing sex workers to HIV, um, to, to accessing HIV services. Uh, we also saw a lot of uh, closure closure of hotspots in terms in times of COVID and even in times of humanitarian crisis. We have seen even in, in cases like in DRC where there, is, uh, there was Ebola, we saw sex workers even relocating, sex workers not being given priority in terms of human rights, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, prioritization when it comes to pandemic. But there are some of the ways that uh, we can say we as sex workers have, have continued to address. For example, in terms of COVID, uh, some of the donors, for example, Frontline AIDS, Uhai, and others, uh, were able to come to aid of sex workers. And uh, a lot of sex workers bought motorbikes, and they could take now supplies to sex workers door to door. We saw also governments coming in and giving sex workers peers badges so that they can be able to, train, to, to go from uh, houses to houses to do door to door, uh, to, to door to door giving of ARVs. We also, as sex workers, we came resilient and we came together more. And uh, as sex workers now, uh, we would borrow, even we would call sex workers, for example, in Tanzania and, and asking them, how are you dealing with the COVID situation? And we saw a lot of learning from each other and, and the resilience amongst us as sex workers, it keeps us with, it keeps us going. Also, another thing is the resilience in terms of peers. I would take, um, their uh, clinics came up with, with uh, 
with innovative ways. For example, a peer could take drugs on behalf of another peer and I could take drugs to my fellow peer. So such resilience and even having a strong movement uh, that I'm sure uh, uh, it have, uh, it's shown, um, it made us going. Also, I wanted to highlight uh, uh, in most of the cases when, when we talk about emergencies and highlighting issues of HIV, we know in most of our cases as sex workers, violation of, of HIV and human rights happens at night. And um, in most cases, we lack resources to address issues uh, of, of, of violation at night because of stigma and the stereotype. And also I want to give a, a, a story whereby uh, a sex worker one day as a paralegal uh, you'll wake up uh, you you a, a typical day of a, of a paralegal you'll wake up you have a, a, like 10 calls you have to respond to those 10 calls some are at night so you'll start working at night so when you go and maybe for example to a police station the police station because of the power dynamic and the stigma and the stereotyping and they'll say this is the same grace uh, the sex worker lawyer is here. And so the stereotyping is too much and the stigma is too much. And most of the time, we as the sex workers who are mandated uh, to be the advocates for our fellow sex workers, there's a lot of stereotyping. We have also seen cases and there's a case currently uh, with a sex worker group in, in Kenya where a sex worker has been beaten to an extent where uh, she's bedridden and she was beaten by a client because that client identified her in a hotspot. And it's because she was called by a fellow sex worker to advocate for the rights. And she was able to take that client to the police station and took her and, and, and the client was, 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 was arrested. But when she went, to, uh, she went to a hotspot and the client identified that girl, she, uh, the client uh, beat that girl to an extent where she's bedridden. And these are emergencies. This is a person in the front line. And these are issues that as the sex workers, we are saying, we also lack, like for example, the emergency funding that is available. We lack even emergency funding for sex workers who stand in the front line. Uh, the sex workers standing on the front line of other sex workers, you're beaten, uh, you're, you're stereotyped, you're on the newspaper. By the, the end of the day, uh, when you're sick, we as the sex workers carry the burden. Like now, if you open most of us sex workers, even the ones on this call, they will attest to that. When you open in our WhatsApp, we have more than 10 WhatsApp group fundraising on behalf of sex workers who have been beaten, who have died, who have issues of violence, who in court. So the burden is to our sex workers. So these are issues that uh, we continue to talk about. And I, I agree with what Louise said that emergency response is a way of addressing the long-term issues in our programs. Uh, but you find that most of the donors shy away from uh, funding emergency response. I don't know whether it's because it's a one-off or it's something that came up because it was not planned for, but most of the time you find that as sex workers, um, we bear the biggest blunt because of those emergencies. And I want to say that, uh, and sorry to say this, um, sex workers' violence is like part of our work because that is how things are. And most of us, when we go to call out for funding, very little donors are there to support the emergency work and the violations for sex workers. And so it's become very hard for us sex workers uh, because we have, um, we, we have very little funding and we have very little donors who are willing to, to fund that. We've seen a lot of money going to biological, uh, biomedical and behavioral, but very little goes to structural intervention. And mostly I want to say about uh, issues of sex workers, very little goes to that, uh, to there. But as I said, the resilience among sex workers has kept us going because we can't leave one of us want to die and we have uh, the social capital, which we take, which 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 we are we are excited about, because the social capital, somebody will uh, contribute one dollar each, one dollar each, and at the end of the day, the sex worker is bailed out. But uh, it's a burden to us, and and that's why we're in this call to say that uh, it's the high time that uh, that that donors came out. And also, I also wanted to highlight the issue of holistic emergency response. And when I say holistic emergency response, is a uh, Sometimes we say emergency response in terms of HIV, but there are other, there are many other things. There is HIV, there is SRP, 
HR. There is also issues of uh, legal redress. So the holistic emergency response, which is very important when it comes to addressing issues of emergency. And then um, I also wanted to say that uh, we, as the movement of sex workers, I think we have really also invested. One of the things I want to highlight is the investment of peer-to-peer -peer education. And the peer education is a very strong uh, pillar for us. And those peer educators also double up as paralegals. So it is a very uh, strong pillar for us as sex workers that have seen us, uh, have kept us going also. I also want to highlight uh, finally, the issues of, as, as I said about the holistic emergencies, there's also emergency in terms of TB, there's emergency in terms of cervical cancer treatment and screening, or even cervical, cervical cancer treatment that we have seen arise among sex workers. And finally, there's also uh, a rise among sex workers for maternal health. We did a research as the African Sex Workers Alliance together with the Global Promise that showed there's a very high, there's very high deaths among sex workers uh, uh, for maternal health. And these are issues that comes up as emergency response that uh, goes unhighlighted and um, that don't get even funding that don't get documented, but uh, we have documented that. And uh, uh, I also want to highlight the issues of, um, of, of, of documentation. We as sex workers have a lot of documentation. We as sex workers, we have a lot of, I can even say, I can, on top of my head, I can even say above 10 sex workers I have known, we've been on the street with who have died because of violence. So we have this data, but it, it is important to support sex workers to document these issues so that we can do better advocacy for a long time and for the work that we do. Yes, thank you. Sorry, Ruth, is it just me or is Ruth or are you on mute? Sorry, I'm not hearing anybody. Okay, I was stuck. I was stuck on silence. Um, thank you so much, Grace. Um, I think you've really brought so much of the realities to um, the event today. And I can see a lot of um, thanks and a lot of celebration of what you've shared in the chat as well. Um, I'm going to turn to to Trevor now. Um, Trevor, Treat ran a crisis response fund serving LGBT people across Zimbabwe, um, part of a wider advocacy program. It would be great to hear what it added to the wider advocacy program to to run that emergency response fund. Um, if you could share with us. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm just, I'm going to try speak quite slowly uh, for the interpreters. I've been told I'm a fast speaker. So in the event that I start to speed up, Ruth, please let me know. Please just remind me. But yes, uh, just to give a bit of background context. Um, so the Out and Proud project uh, was an ambitious three-year project. Today is the last day of the project, actually. That was implemented in three countries across Southern Africa, Malawi, Eswatini, and Zimbabwe. Um, so in the initial design of the project, we actually had not factored in the possibility of a crisis response or an emergency fund. But um, as we started the, 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 the project, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, and uh, the entire world was essentially thrown into a crisis. And we knew immediately that uh, LGBTI persons uh, were probably facing a disproportionate um, a level of risk and vulnerability compared to everyone else. I mean, everyone did perhaps at some point lose their loss of income, uh, they lost their jobs and so forth. Uh, but we realized that 
unlike uh, the average person who could fall back on family and community for support, a lot of LGBTI persons were already estranged from their families uh, due to a lot of other issues and therefore do not have this kind of fallback. So we quickly did a, a needs assessment or a quick survey, a risk and vulnerability survey, and that's when the need for uh, an emergency fund or a crisis response was highlighted. Um, so as a result, that's how we ended up with a, an emergency fund integrated into a bigger um, project, essentially. So as, as part of the emergency fund, we designed a tool that we call the advocacy data gathering uh, table. And the purpose of this tool was essentially to document the kind of human rights violations that we were receiving uh, when we received those cases for the crisis response. And what we did with this information is um, firstly, a component of the broader project that we had was on strategic litigation and legal cases to advance LGBTI rights. So we would often use those cases and the data that we had to try and identify um, cases that could potentially be good for strategic litigation or that we could pursue for legal cases. Uh, secondly, we, as part of the project, we also were engaging with the Human Rights uh, International Mechanism. So we led the process uh, for um, sub submitting or elaborating a UPR, the Universal Periodic Review Shadow Report. And this is this data on the type of human rights violations and the kind of violences, risks, uh, and types of discrimination that we're collecting from the emergency fund was actually included in our report. And uh, a result of that is for the first time, the Zimbabwean government actually accepted two surgery related uh, recommendations. And in one of those recommendations, uh, it spoke to preventing violence against uh, all persons based on sexual orientation, uh, gender identity, and expression. Uh, so the crisis response mechanism also contributed towards uh, building synergies and strengthening the partnerships uh, within the LGBTI movement as a well. whole. Uh, this was a national response, so it was not necessarily owned by TRIT. We were just the fiscal host, but the way we designed it, the mechanism was designed in such a way that every LGBTI CSO had a role to play. So from the time uh, an application was received, it was rece received through the LGBTI CSO, which will then uh, send it to the, to the crisis task team. This was a group of individuals who were also from the community that were responsible for evaluating the cases to see which one met the criteria before it came to us. And this kind of working together really resulted in the movement essentially um, being more, I think it helped us, it strengthened the way in which we worked. It helped us to work together better because this it, is, it essentially felt like running a project together. And usually what that does is it helps um, strengthen the kind of partnerships that you have as a movement. Um, Furthermore, beyond the Out and Proud project, I'd say the Emergency Fund also helped direct our programming. Uh, with the cases that we received, it, it really helped us unearth the deep-rooted socioeconomic vulnerabilities that were faced by the LGBTI community. And uh, as a result, it highlighted the need for programming which responded to this social and economic empowerment related problems. And while we did not necessarily deal with this under the Out and Proud activity, we have seen more projects come up in Zimbabwe that particularly focus on the social and economic empowerment of the, of the community. And uh, lastly, the fund also contributed to efforts to actually prevent HIV, because we did realize that in the event that the crisis response was not there, and uh, those community members in need uh, of assistance, they would have found themselves in situations where they were vulnerable and perhaps not in a position where they can negotiate, especially when it comes to safer sex, um, in the event that the only way they could get shelter and food and accommodation was through uh, exchange with someone who possibly wanted sexual favors in return. So by being able to provide them with the basic needs so that they can focus on getting their lives back again and getting back on their feet, uh, it helped to ensure that they didn't find themselves in a situation or, or in situations where they are absolutely vulnerable and they end up doing things that they may not want to do that may eventually lead to, to, to um, cases, to more cases of um, um, HIV and so forth. So I, I would say in a nutshell, uh, beyond just it being an emergency fund, it, it contributed greatly to the broader project, but also even to our programming as an entire LGBTI movement in Zimbabwe. Mm. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Trevor. Um, and if I could push you um, to, to briefly comment on what difference it made that this was a community-led 
um, crisis response system. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think the added value of it being community led firstly was uh, increased accessibility for the average community member. Uh, it, it, it lessened the amount of um, response time because we stayed with the funds internally at treat. And immediately when we would hear that there's a case, it was so it was so much easier for us to reach the beneficiaries of um, of, of, of their fund of the of the crisis response fund. And secondly, um, it, it built the collective capacity, I think, uh, at both at an individual level and organizational level for the organizations that were involved in, in the mechanism. Uh, so we, we, learned, we learned quite a lot, uh, especially when it came to financial management of uh, running an, an emergency um, fund mechanism. Uh, we learned, uh, it also, I think, helped build uh, linkages and connections uh, among community members and uh, strengthened the LGBT movement as well. It goes back to the point that I was speaking on earlier about how um, the emergency fund or the crisis response itself really helped us to work together uh, much better. And uh, the community members, when, when we asked the community members how they felt about the fund being community led, the biggest thing they highlighted was the fact that it, it felt so reassuring if they walked into a room where they are being their needs are being served by someone who is a part of their community, by familiar faces, and uh, it, it also helped promote trust between uh, the community members and the LGBT CSRs because they knew that they could always uh, come to us for help. So I think it being led by the community really helped the community feel like the fund was for them, and they're not. Mm -hmm. They they felt they could relate to the fund, and it was really there to help them. Thank you, Trevor, and we wish you well on this last day of the project. Um, I would love to come back with more questions, but we, we need to go to Ronan um, and do keep putting your questions for speakers into the chat. Um, Ronan, welcome. Are there any reflections that you would like to share um, on what you've heard today or about the good practice brief? Um, that you have seen and which will shortly be available for our audience. Yeah, thanks, Ruth, and, um, and thanks for the opportunity to speak today and uh, together with Grace and Trevor, fantastic um, uh, overview of the work they do and especially just hearing the, the difficulties that Grace has highlighted on the front line. I mean, it just shows the importance of not only the Rapid Response Fund, but I mean, having this good practice brief now, like I think it really will serve as a good starting point either for existing organizations that want to move into this emergency response uh, uh just kind of integrating that emergency response uh, into their existing programming or for a new uh, community-based organization for example to to move into this space as well and to work on i think it's it's critically important and i mean just echoing grace's call again for more donors i mean as a donor i mean we very proud of the relationship with frontline aids and a lot of the issues that uh, she spoke about in terms of um, the restrictions that came out through the pandemic and the restriction on rights and the, those difficulties were one of the kind of driving factors for Ireland to support frontline aids. I mean, in our international development policy, it, the focus is really on those furthest behind or those mo most marginalized. So uh, that was really what sparked that uh, relationship with frontline aids and then uh, in particular, to support the Rapid Response Fund to be able to uh, directly uh, fund uh, emergency response work. Um, and I would just yeah, echo that call for other donors to support this work. It's, it's critically important. And um, as Trevor was saying as well, it's, it's not just you know, money that goes in and disappears. It's, it's used for data collection and it feeds into wider advocacy work. It's, it's raising further awareness beyond one small emergency that, that data that's collected that information can be used to you know increase organizations profile in the country to access more funding down the line and um, it increases uh it, you know push pressure and accountability on governments as well they, they see more of this data you know of human rights violations and abuses and it's really really important um to you know for for not only donors to get behind this kind of emergency response work but to see that additional benefit of it it's not just money that is quickly put in one place and disappears it's got more sustainable long-term kind of impact mm -hmm. um i suppose on the on the brief itself i mean 
yeah, it's it, like I said, it's very, very useful for for kind of organizations, I think, as a starting point to get into this work. And um, it highlights a lot of the key principles that we would look for in funding in terms of the emphasis on do no harm and accountability. Um, and it's something I think that's really important that we have with our partners that, you know, we do need to ensure that even if it's an emergency response, there are key protection steps, et cetera, that are there. Um, that you know we can't overlook due to rapid planning or implementation. So it's really good to see that in the good practice uh, brief. Um, I think it does highlight as well the different type of emergency response models. Um, every context is different. Every every organization that is doing this work is going to be different. So it's a really good guide, I think, to for organizations to look at their own capacity, their own ability to see how they can do this kind of work um what kind of model do they want to do um for example the rapid response funds you know being connected to a larger to, to a larger ngo that can uh, provide money or you know work as a collective for example to access funding so i think it's very useful um in that sense um i think just where we are in terms of like i say that call for funding for other donors um i mean it's it that was the reason that we, you know, got into the partnership from that aids. Obviously, was a lot of this work in reaction to, to some of the challenges that came up from the pandemic. But underlying that is that trust building relationship, and I think that's something that, um, you know, it was mentioned uh, by the speakers as well so far. You know, having that trust with communities as well for community-led uh, responses, having that trust between donors and organizations that you know, funds that are public public money are going to be spent in the right way. And um, even in an emergency with very little time, you know, when that trust is there, when that commitment to the work is there, I think that's what makes emergency response work, um, you know, work more effectively in that sense. So, um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing those reflections and um, encouragements, Ronan. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers. We've got a number of questions in the chat and I'm going to come to you, Grace, first with the question from uh, someone called Jessica Laura in the chat. So they have asked, is it possible to advocate, advocate for advocacy funds from donors who support HIV prevention and care, but will always demand for data on violence? Grace, would you like to speak to that question? Yes, uh, thank you so much. And um, I think um, we, we started this discussion with sex workers because during COVID, we realized that um, very little um, partners and donors were willing to support issues of sex workers. And we started this conversation of the sex worker movement together with our members on how we can set up a resilience fund for sex worker. And sex workers, this is the conversation that we are still having and how to set up a resilience fund for sex workers because we've realized there's a lot of uh, violence and a lot of um, issues that need emergency response. And we feel that most of the time when sex workers ask for emergency response, it takes a while before the money gets to the sex workers because the money is held by other partners. They need to get a reference. By the time they get a reference, already the case or uh, the issue is already gone. And I support what Trevor said that uh, with the fund that they are running, it was closer to the people. Our problem with sex workers is we lack a fund that is community led and for community and by sex workers. So we lack that and that's why it takes a lot of time before sex workers get emergency funding. I also want to add that we have a murder monitoring tool uh, that is an excellent tool that with the help of frontline aids, we were able to uh, develop it to collect data. But the problem is we haven't had a chance to train sex workers on how to better document uh, um, uh, the murders and the violence of sex workers. This is something we can also write on so that we can be able to collect more information and more data to do better advocacy for the work that we are doing. So Laura, yes, it is work in progress. And um, this is one of the conditions that we'll have and many others to support the Resilience Fund for Sex Workers. Yes. Thanks, Grace. Um, there's a question I'd like to put to you, Trevor. Um, someone has asked, what are the most common emergencies 
that we've witnessed through the RRF when it comes to health, human rights and HIV. Rather than me answer about the frontline AIDS RRF, I thought you might want to speak about Treat's experience. Uh, please come again, Ruth. I think I lost you for a bit. Yeah. Um, the question is about um, what, what are the most common emergency situations that you have witnessed um, through your mechanism in okay. Zimbabwe? All right, thank you, Ruth. So I think the most common that we, we um, experienced was uh, people being essentially chased away from home because uh, either the guardian or the parents found out about their sexual orientation and gender identity. That is actually quite common uh, in, in Zimbabwe because uh, the majority are, the majority of years generally are not, and the environment is not favorable for LGBTI persons. So we, we, we often had situations where people were, were homeless and uh, the hardest part being it's, it's usually within a certain range where someone is not financially independent yet. Uh, they are above 18, but also they do not have a, a job and they're still probably finishing off university education and so forth. So those, those, those were the biggest uh, issues that we faced where uh, we were faced with either having to find accommodation for this kind of for these kind of uh, people, but at the same time putting into the fact that they still need education, they still need certain things that the emergency funds could not cover. So that that was a challenge. It's a whole uh, other conversation, but that was that was the biggest issue. Uh, the second one was uh, violence. Um, so quite often we have LGBTI sex workers too that would often uh, find themselves in a situation where they were uh, either assaulted or physically uh, beaten up um, because um, of, of either their sexual orientation or because of other situations like in the environment that they work in. It could be that it's not safe and um, they, were, they were not in a position where they could negotiate safety. So we also would stay step in, in those situations and assist them with medical um, related assistance and, um, and other forms of help. So I think these are the two uh, biggest issues that we consistently uh, got where people were, um, they lost their shelter um, because of their sexual orientation or LGBT sex workers who were consistently violated um, and we had to seek medical assistance for them and uh, other forms of legal recourse. Thanks Trevor and I can add that for frontline aides over gosh five years of running the rapid response fund the most common um, purpose of the grants has been for temporary accommodation and relocation also with people fleeing um, violence of many forms within the home or the community. So community members and activists, frontline workers, as Grace has mentioned, you know, this is an issue that affects activists who are close to and part of communities as well. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, another one for you, Grace. Someone has asked, what examples of projects are there for addressing stigma and discrimination against sex workers by the authorities? I think you you mentioned some earlier, but maybe you could would like to to come back and highlight a couple of things that you're doing with with ASWA and members. Okay, so some of the things, uh, some of the projects that our members are doing is. Uh, there is a lot of training among sex workers uh, to law enforcers. Um, I want to highlight an example of Benin. Uh, they are doing, since uh, the decree by the city to remove sex workers, they have started a project whereby they go in every district, uh, training police and magistrates on issues of sex workers so that they are lenient on judgments to sex workers. Uh, there is also a project on paralegal training where sex workers are trained on basic legal rights of a sex worker so that when a sex worker is arrested uh, for uh, emergency response or before the organization gets money for a lawyer, uh, there is a person in place who understands basic legal issues. Also, we have seen a lot of training among sex worker groups on issues of healthcare providers, healthcare providers being sensitized about issues of rape, issues of uh, 
PEP, PrEP access to among sex workers. So these are some of the uh, trainings we've seen. We have also seen sex workers themselves and organization of sex workers being capacity built um, on issues of the constitution in their different countries and the context of the constitution in the different countries, because we have seen a lot, a lot of African, majority of the African countries criminalize sex work. So, and most of the sex workers, you find that, uh, for example, in most Anglophone countries, there's no line that explicitly uh, uh, illegal, uh, says that sex work is illegal, but it's living off the proceeds of sex work. So there are programs that uh, capacity build sex workers on the constitution and what exactly the constitution says about uh, about sex workers. Also, we have seen issues about movement building. A lot of work is being done about movement building, like as the African sex workers, uh, we run a sex worker of a sex worker academy, whereby we bring sex workers from different African countries to learn from each other and share best practices. And this uh, building movement amongst ourselves and learning from each other, it has made us strong so that we can uh, we can build resilience and a strong movement. Because when we learn from each other, we are able uh, to replicate uh, best practice from other countries. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, I can see there are some questions more about the Frontline AIDS Rapid Response Fund. And please do send your questions to us um, directly after this event. We want to keep the focus here on the work being done across the partnership on and local um, emergency response funds. Um, one final question was about the top recommendations from the good practice guide. Um, so I would like to um, answer this and say that the, the good practice brief will be out um, shortly after this event and we will contact everyone who's attended with a link to that brief and a link to the video so you can read it for yourself. Um, but really, uh, the, the good practice brief is not, it's not making direct recommendations. It is giving an outline and a framework for thinking through the questions that organizations need to consider. What does an emergency look like in your situation? How does it link to HIV? What can your organization do or not do? And how do we protect staff and volunteers and clients within all of this work. So it would be hard for me to say three recommendations, but overall, hopefully it, you will find that it's useful for thinking through some of the important questions and factors. We are getting very close to the end of our time. So unless there's any more urgent contributions from speakers, I will start to draw us to a close. And just to say thank you so much for everyone's engagement um, I think for me, what today has highlighted is that this area of work is very complex, but it's also where we get to the, you know, it's one of the most um, person-centered areas of work that speaks to us across the divides of HIV or human rights work, emergency response or advocacy work. Um, We've heard about the everyday impacts of criminalization and the the work that needs to continue to do the longer term um, to, to break down barriers in the longer term for a human rights enabling environment. Um, we will be sharing with you the call to action and the recommendations that Frontline AIDS make is making to funders and program designers for greater flexibility within existing grants and for the integration of emergency response within larger human rights programs, as well as the creation of um, emergency response funds for those most hostile environments. Um, do you get in touch with us at Rapid Response Fund at Frontline AIDS. Um, and I'm going to hand to Lois for some final words and to close our event today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ruth, for the excellent facilitation. 
I want to end the day today by thanking you all for your participation in this very important event and helping us to launch this excellent tool. As you heard, the tool is a call to action to donors and key stakeholders to continue to invest in the important work of responding to emergencies among already stigmatized and often persecuted communities. Please take this document and use it in your programs for advocacy and to strengthen your HIV and human rights-based programs. I also would like to thank our implementing partners who work in very hostile and highly stigmatized communities to reach LGBT plus sex workers and people who use drugs with the emergency responses when they are needed. As you heard from us, sometimes they receive calls at in the middle of the night when someone is on the run, they sometimes they do accommodate them even in their own homes before they can find alternative accommodation. And so we really, really would like to thank you for the work that you are doing on the ground. I also would like to extend our appreciation to those funders who believed in this work and have supported us. In particular, I would like to mention the government of Ireland represented here today by Ronan Swaney for the support that they have uh, contributed to this fund. Also, in addition, uh, funders like Elton John AIDS Foundation, Gilead and CEDA. This funding has enabled frontline aids to build strong foundations for our human rights work. It afforded us the ability to act strategically and put in place what we needed to streamline our rapid response fund and our community-led monitoring tool REACT, which you had us uh, referring to, as well as our advocacy work on human rights. We have seen today how important it is to include all of these elements in order to have a comprehensive, holistic and sustainable human rights response. I think Trevor spoke very well to that about their program, which initially when they started, it didn't have an emergency response component, but when COVID hit, they did realize that uh, this was required. And we are happy that we were able to respond at that particular moment. Lastly, I would like to thank our frontline aid staff uh, led by Ruth, who implemented this program and also organized this exciting event today. And with that, I would like to officially uh, close this uh, webinar and to wish all of you a good day. And thank you very much. Thank you. I hand over to Ruth. I think you've said it all now, Lois. <laughs> I think it's time to just say, say goodbye. Everyone has a busy day and I'm sure much to get to before uh, we are almost in February. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone.